Hey, I'm Dr. Dave. I'm a colorectal surgeon in Denver, Colorado. I work with Denver Colorectal Specialists. Please check us out on the web. I trained at the Mayo Clinic and I've been in practice for 25 years. Join me as we talk about diverticulosis. Now, if you just got diagnosed with this, please relax and know that the vast majority of people that have this have no problems from it whatsoever. So relax, sit back and watch as we talk about what it looks like, why it occurs, what causes it, who gets it, what kind of problems could potentially develop from it, and what do you do about it if you have it to prevent these problems from occurring. So please come scrub in with me, Dr. Dave, as we talk about diverticulosis. Okay, so let's first start with an anatomy lesson. The colon, also known as the large bowel or large intestine, is the last part of our digestive system. It's about four feet long and it has several sections to it, each with a different name. Now the first part is called the cecum and this is where the liquid waste enters our colon from the small intestine. Next, everything travels through the right colon, then the transverse colon, then the left colon. Now these names are pretty obvious, but the next section is the sigma colon. And this is very important because this is the part of the colon we're going to be talking about the most today because this is where diverticulosis most commonly occurs. It comes from the Greek language and it comes from the meaning for the letter S because as our colon lies in our body, it kind of looks like a backward sideways S. Now the last section of our colon is called the rectum. And this comes from the Latin word meaning straight because this is a pretty straight part of our intestine. Now, if you like recycling, you're gonna love your colon. This may become your favorite part of your body because the main function of the colon is to recycle water from our waste, put it back in our body as that moves through the length of our colon. And it can take anywhere from one to three days for waste to move the entire length of our colon before it exits our body. Okay, so diverticulosis refers to little pockets or outpouchings or sacs that develop in the wall of the colon. Now, they can occur anywhere in your colon other than the rectum, but the vast majority of these occur in the sigma colon. And I'm going to get into why that is in just a second. So if you're not having any symptoms, how do you even know if you have diverticulosis? Well, the majority of the time they're found incidentally, meaning you didn't even know you had it, on a colonoscopy. When I see them, they can be small like this, big like this, you can see a lot of them like this, or they can take on a familiar shape, kind of like this. Did you see it? Probably my imagination. So what's interesting is people that have a lot of pockets or big pockets don't seem to be at any increased risk of having problems from it. I know it seems like that should occur, but it doesn't. So if you're one of those people that has extensive diverticulosis, relax and know that you're not at any increased risk of having problems from it. So what causes diverticulosis to occur more commonly in the sigma colon than any other part of the colon? We believe because the sigma colon is much more muscular, as it moves things through, it creates a much higher pressure in that part of the colon, and that pressure pushes out on the bile wall and causes these pockets to form. This pressure buildup can kind of back up along the colon, so you can see pockets form kind of in a backwards fashion, but they still occur more commonly into a greater number in the sigma colon. Okay, so why does it occur? Well, certainly we know genetics plays a role in this as it does in many of the problems that develop in our body. But what's interesting is the country that has the highest incidence of diverticulosis in the world is guess where? You got it, the US. It's also commonly seen in places like England and Australia. And it's much less common in places like Asia and Africa. Well, why is that? What is it about these red countries that causes such a high incidence of diverticulosis? Well, certainly lifestyle plays a role in that, but the most important factor is our diet. The good old American diet is probably the biggest contributor to the high incidence of diverticulosis in this country. Recognize anything in this picture? What is it about our diet that makes diverticulosis so common? It's the lack of fiber that we get on a day-to-day -day basis. I know a lot of you are saying, well, wait a second, I get plenty of fiber. And you know what, kudos to you if you do. It's estimated that we need 25 to 35 grams a day. And in this country, it's believed that only about 5% of Americans get enough fiber day to day. 5%, that is just crazy. We need more fiber. Okay, so what is it about fiber that makes it so important? Well, fiber stimulates the waste in our colon to move through at a regular speed. So remember I talked about one to three days it takes for things to move through? A lot of that depends on how much fiber is in our diet. So the less fiber, the longer it takes to move through the colon, the longer it sits there, the more the colon is pushing on that waste to get it through and in increasing that pressure, which is pushing out on the bowel wall and causing these pockets to form. 
Okay, I want to get into what problems can occur from diverticulosis, but first, let's talk about terminology. One single pocket or outpouching in your colon is referred to as a diverticulum. Not diverticulum, not diverticuli, diverticulum. As in, Dr. Dave diagnosed my diverticulum down in Denver. Say that five times fast. No, don't have them say that five times fast. Don't, please don't say that five times fast. Don't. Okay, so one pocket is called the diverticulum. The presence of multiple pockets is called diverticulosis. People often use the term diverticulosis and diverticulitis interchangeably as if they mean the same thing, which they do not. They're different. Here, let me explain. Diverticulosis has the last four letters O-S-I-S, whereas diverticulitis has the last four letters I-T-I-S. Other than that, they're similar. When O-S-I-S, osis is at the end of a word, it means simply having the condition. So diverticulosis means just having these pockets or outpouchings in your colon. Now, diverticulitis has the last four letters, I-T-I-S. When you see itis at the end of a word, it means inflammation or infection of that part of the body. So diverticulitis means having inflammation or infection of one of these pockets. When that occurs, that infection can be just around the colon or it can spread outside to other parts of the body. Okay, so when do we get diverticulosis? Clearly, we're not born with it, so we develop it at some point. When does that occur? Well, in the U.S., studies have shown that about 30% of the population age 50 has diverticulosis, and this more than doubles to 70% by the time people reach the age of 80. That's a lot, but the good news is that if someone has diverticulosis, recent studies have shown that it goes on to cause problems in less than 10% of the population. The other problem we see from diverticulosis is bleeding. Sometimes these little pockets can bleed. When that happens, it's usually a lot of blood. So if you see a little bit of blood, it doesn't typically mean that you have diverticulosis. And the good news is that this is even less common than diverticulitis. One other symptom I'd like to mention, cramping or bloating from diverticulosis. Occasionally we see it, it's not very common, but it is sometimes associated with it. So if you have diverticulosis, are you doomed? Absolutely not. If you have it, and especially if you've watched this video, you know that it's very uncommon to have complications from it. What can you do to improve your odds? Exercise regularly, get a diet high in fiber. Remember, 25 to 35 grams a day is what's recommended. Put together here a quick list of some simple foods that are high in fiber. You can see almonds, great source, but that's a cup, that's a lot of almonds. Dark chocolate, gotta love that. Three grams per ounce. Try not to get all your fiber intake from dark chocolate. But still, for most of us, getting 25 to 35 grams a day is a challenge to do that and sustain it for long term. So what I recommend to my patients and what I do myself is I take a fiber supplement. Here is a picture from my local supermarket that shows the fiber supplements that are available on the shelf. You can see there's powder, there's pills, there's some other choices. Powder has the most fiber per dose, but for a lot of people that causes cramping or bloating. So I think pills are a good second option. There's just not as much fiber in each of those pills. So check the labels to see how much fiber per pill so you can get the right amount. But don't try to make the fiber supplement your entire fiber intake. Still try to take some fruits and vegetables on a daily basis. Combination of that, you're gonna be in good shape. One last thing I should mention, some of my patients have read online or heard from friends that they should avoid seeds and nuts if they have diverticulosis. That's old school. We've since debunked that. We haven't shown any proof that these seeds or nuts could get stuck in these pockets and cause a problem. So if you enjoy seeds and nuts, by all means, keep enjoying them. Don't worry, they won't cause you any problems. Thanks again for watching my video on diverticulosis. I hope you learned a lot. Tell all your friends and family that you scrubbed in with Dr. Dave and that's where you learned all about it. Also look for my videos on diverticulitis and surgery for diverticulitis, as well as lots of different colorectal issues that I deal with every day in my practice. Thanks again for watching. I look forward to seeing you in my next video.